to say good morning. Um, thanks for joining us for Startups in the Law. Um, uh, we are really excited to do this. This is the second month that we've done this. We had um, some pretty good feedback from the last event um, that we did on May 5th, which I have posted the video for that on our YouTube channel. You can look us up by our name, Jones Kurtz, uh, for the previous video where we go into a lot of the stuff, um, a lot of the more basic stuff related to startups in the law. Um, before we go ahead and get started, though, I'm going to let Tritt take over and discuss a little bit about um, how to use WebEx and uh, and how to use the chat feature and everything like that. So, Tritt. Thanks, Carl. Um, hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Tritt. I work at Capital Factory. As I'm sure you've noticed that all of your microphone is muted. Um, so if you look to the right side of your screen, you're going to see a chat function and a Q&A function. Um, in the chat function, you guys are welcome to drop your LinkedIn, communicate with one another, um, share information that way. And if you have any AV issues, just shoot me a chat um, and I can talk to you that way. And if you have any questions for Kyle um, as you go, as he goes through his um, presentation today, just feel free to use the Q&A, which is on the bottom right of your corner, the bottom right corner of your screen. And then I will, um, I'll let Kyle know that he has a question and I'll read your question out loud for you. Um, and yeah. if for any reason you don't see a chat or a Q&A function, if you hover your mouse to the bottom of your screen, you're going to see these icons pop up. Um, and the cloud is the chat function. And then the, um, the square with a question mark is where you can click on it for the Q&A window to pop up. And then I do recommend that you go to the top right corner of your screen. You're going to see um, a white circle. And if you hover your mouse on it, there's going to be three options. I would highly recommend you pick the side-by-side um, -side view, just so that way you can see Kyle and see his presentation side-by-side. Um, -side. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and yeah, all right. that's all I got. Thanks, Tripp. Um, so, the, just so you guys are aware, this uh, this presentation is hosted by Capital Factory. Um, our law firm is a member of Capital Factory. I work out of there normally, and uh, Capital Factory is an awesome place um, to start and grow your business. I mean, they are super. They have a ton of resources. They're super resourceful. If you live in Dallas, Austin, or Houston, um, I would suggest, and you are interested in starting a tech startup or already have one and you're looking for a place to grow it, um, an office out of, I would suggest getting in touch with them. Um, Capital Factory also does run, uh, I believe it's the most active venture capital fund in uh, the state of Texas. They are not the largest, but they make the most, uh, but they do the most deals um, and have the highest deal volume of any VC fund um, in, the, in the state. So uh, really, really great place uh, to work out of. Uh, just so you're aware, um, Jones Kurtz, I mean, we are a small boutique law firm that does, that, that serves four primary groups of people, entrepreneurs, startups, really rapidly growing companies, as well as investors for startups and investors in venture capital funds and private equity funds and other things. So um, I am the managing partner of our Dallas office. Matt Jones is the managing partner of our Oklahoma office. Um, in every state but Texas, we actually go by a what is known as a trade name. We go by the name Burge Law Group. Um, uh, Texas has weird naming rules, so we had to name the law firm after ourselves here. Uh, but uh, I mean, if here's our contact information. If you have any pointed questions or want to reach out and ask us a more legal question where you might need advice, go ahead and email me or Matt. Um, by the way, Matt will not be here today. Uh, he, he unfortunately is too busy to join the call today, but he will be on next month, um, as well as we're going to try to have a few different guests come on and speak uh, when we do these presentations in the future. Um, right now, though, we're sort of going through the basics of uh, startups in the law, as well as some not so basic stuff. Just to give you guys a, more of a feel, these first few videos are going to be, these first few vid videos and webinars are going to be more educational and sort of build on a series of here's the issues you need to be aware of, here's how to navigate these problems. And then as we go forward, we might, we're going to address a fair bit of more complex stuff. So uh, without further ado, um, topics we're going to cover today, 
So post COVID uh, nineteen legal updates, startup formation and structuring, VC deals, um, essential startup contracts, employment law for startups. A lot of this stuff is going to overlap. We're going to address all of it simultaneously. So if you have a pointed question about any of this stuff, please feel free uh, to to ask a question in the chat. Feel and and Trit will moderate and stop me every now and then before I move on to the next section, just to make sure that we're answering those questions when the topics are coming up. Um, why we do this, better education, better foundation, more successful startups. The reality is oftentimes we see people that come to us with problems that could have been solved if they had just let us form their business for them, get all their contracts set up and help them and help them with that initial formation, as well as just have conversations with them about the questions they had for their startup. A lot of people are answering their, those questions by themselves with no advice from an attorney and sort of just relying on the advice of other people who maybe might have done something similar in the past, but have not actually had the same situation. Um, my, the, the number one thing I will tell you though throughout this is, please remember that we're not trying to give you full-blown legal advice. This stuff is not specific to your business. If you do have a pointed question, I mean, please, uh, with your questions, please try to keep them a, a little bit more generalized so that um, I'm not actually giving you legal advice. Um, if I do believe the question is going to be in the form of legal, it is going to require an answer that would be more legal advice specific to your business, I may stop myself and say, that's a better question for me in an email rather than to answer on the presentation. I will try to answer uh, everything, though, as best as I can, as generally as I can, and in a way that will provide you with the most information. So, um, Without further ado, I'm going to go into some legal updates for startups and small businesses. So the reopen Texas measures and guidelines have been published um, uh, as of early to middle of last month. They have been increasing the amount of uh, the capacity in which people are allowed to open their businesses. Many businesses are actually now allowed to operate at a 50 percent capacity. This includes dine in restaurants, sit downs, things like that. Certain bars are allowed to open, but very, but but they are restricting certain things like really interactive, um, really interactive uh, areas. So if if you run like a bar or an arcade or something that is a mix of the two, you're probably not going to be allowed to run the arcade portion of that bar. You may be able to have people uh, come in for drinks, come in for food. But you really can't do that. You really can't do much else at the moment. That said, um, when it comes to office buildings and normal employers, I believe Capital Factory is still subject to a 25% rule. I've been advising our co-working clients um, and those people that have commercial real estate and office space that, hey, you're still under 25%. Some lawyers have been trying to tell me that, uh, no, your, your clients need to open at 50%. Like, that's not true at the moment, like the, for, for a lot of businesses. Also, there are certain counties in which businesses have been whitelisted, like to open at 50% capacity throughout the whole county as a blanket, as a, as a blanket sort of order. Um, you, that requires that it, the, the local head county judge sign an attestation form, and, and then those people get added to what I would just call a whitelist. Um, you can find that actually on the Reopen Texas website and on the Department of uh, Health and Human Services website. Uh, if you wanna see if your county is covered, just so you're aware, Dallas County, Travis County, Harris County are not covered on that list. Um, though, if you have been out to bars and restaurants, you've probably seen that a fair bit of people have actually been uh, at those bars. I would argue that most places that, that are operating as, as just normal bar uh normal bars and uh restaurant venues like the reality is they're not adhering to the 25 percent rules in many cases they're not adhering to the 50 percent rule um if you run a bar or restaurant uh you have to abide by those rules you are subject to lose your license and permitting if you do not um that said i think a lot of people in those businesses are looking at it more from an economic standpoint than from the standpoint of i could lose my business uh the the idea though is i mean i mean bad facts bad law don't do anything that you're not allowed to do don't do anything that's illegal i mean and it is illegal for you to operate a bar 
at more than a 50% capacity in the state of Texas right now. Um, also, it's just a matter of safety. We obviously don't want people um, to die. We don't want people to get sick. Um, and it's just better policy all around the, for you to adhere to the rules. So moving on, um, last time we talked about some legal theories excusing contractual performance. So these first, uh, we went through these pretty in depth and I think we spent about 10 minutes on it. The first three here are what I would call true legal theories. The last one, force majeure, is really more just a contract clause in each individual contract that we see uh, in each. And usually we include these in major commercial agreements. The reason I wanna point this out is because this is fairly important along the lines of uh, current events that have been happening, especially with respect to um, civil unrest and, uh, and the riots that we've seen throughout the country as well as in our own state. Um, uh, I, I do wanna discuss this portion and I have it on the next slide uh, that we're gonna talk about. So commercial, this ties into commercial insurance policy. So um, generally speaking, when you start a business, if you're doing a particular type of business, you may need particular insurance. So for, to give you an example, um, lawyers are gonna have malpractice insurance, doctors are gonna have uh, medical malpractice insurance, accountants as well are gonna have malpractice insurance. This is also known as professional liability insurance or errors and omissions insurance. Um, the other thing I would remember is a lot of people, the hot topic has been business interruption insurance, uh, as well as workers' comp insurance and things like that. The, I mean, business interruption insurance, generally speaking, in the middle of a pandemic is not going, you are not going to be able to make a claim under it. And I'll explain why here in a little bit. Uh, the, the the major issue uh, has to do with, I mean, previous epidemics as well as pandemics that we've experienced related to the SARS outbreak. Um, with respect to, like, a, I mean, with respect to these insurance policies, though, I mean, generally, you do need to sit down and think, what should be, what about my business is insurable? And does it make sense for me to afford insurance or for me to pay for insurance for this type of thing you might think i can't afford insurance right now i think the real question is can you afford not to have insurance um in some in some cases people live and die by their insurance uh i mean to give you an example i helped somebody set up a valet parking business and the bulk of the cost of running that entire business was actually insurance it had almost nothing to do with employing people. It was actually really cheap to employ people for that. Um, for the most part, for the most part, that business pays for itself, except for the insurance. When everything shut down, they had they had a, a really high insurance premium every single month that they were paying on, and they they inevitably had to pay the fees in order to cancel it because they said, "Well, there's no there there there's no light at the end of the tunnel here that we can see that's going to allow us to operate this business at full capacity. So, um, and I think a lot of businesses that may have been affected by um, that, that may have been affected by the riots, like which I'm going to talk about here in a minute, uh, like they may have actually canceled their insurance policies for the time being because they were not doing any more business at the time. Uh, so, I mean, here's a question for you, if, like the, that of lawyers like us will often get, if my business is burned down, destroyed, or if my inventory is stolen during a riot, will my insurance cover me? Maybe, but in, in many cases, we're saying probably not. The reason has to do with the force majeure clauses. Usually a force majeure provision specifically carves out riots or what are known as civil insurrections. Civil insurrections are a really fancy legal term for basically revolutions. Um, that said, it's not as extreme as like, say, a national revolution. Um, like the, we're not talking scale wise of uh, US revolution usually. Um, like I think civil insur insurrections are uh, more, much more common usually in third world countries and, and more international commercial agreements and transactions. The, uh, when, and when it comes to like a, the interplay between a policy for, say, you just have commercial insurance or property insurance, 
I mean, you have, you have fire protection insurance as well. You're looking at like, are we protected for the destruction during a riot? Some of these, some of these insurance policies actually do have add-ons where you can pay an additional premium for, to include riots or civil unrest under what are known as a list of covered perils. So covered perils would be things like fire, would be things in, in certain cases like flood as the result of a tenant from above you or a tenant to the side of you, like that, that ended up happening that disrupted your business, right? Unfortunately though, I mean, I think for the most part, we're going to see that a lot of the businesses that were destroyed in these riots, they managed to survive the crisis in COVID-19 and had literally just opened up in the last two weeks. Uh, but unfortunately, their like their insurance premiums like are not the their insurance is just not going to cover any sort of claim related to um, the burglary or destruction of their property. As a matter of fact, the best the best solution for that is they're going to have to set up a GoFundMe and see if they can get um, other people to donate toward the cause uh, to rebuild their business. That's the sad that that's the sad story there. Um, I wish that wasn't the case, but that's often the legal case. And I mean, you can sit there and say, I mean, what are we to do about that? The truth is read your insurance policy. If you're not covered by it, I mean, my recommendation to people is if you believe that your business is in an area, or in an area that will be subject to a riot, maybe call your landlord um, or use a little self-help and board up your place to ensure that your stuff doesn't go missing. I would also recommend that you take an inventory of your business and that you actually, uh, I mean, you write down a list, take pictures of everything, make sure you take pictures, I mean, very clear photos. I mean, write down everything that you can about it. I mean, and lastly, I mean, if, if you do have to make a claim, make that claim, document everything. And then if you get rejected and you do believe or your lawyer believes that you were actually covered under your policy for this situation, then it's time to potentially, I mean, initiate a lawsuit against your insurance company. Obviously, that's not ideal, but um, it, many times it just takes a lawyer getting involved uh, to get an insurance company to make a move on, on awarding you a claim. Uh, I mean, that said, I mean, I would say if you do have a business interruption policy, do take a look at that as well and see if you are covered. The business interruption policies were a hot topic at the beginning of this thing, but I want to circle back with them because they do relate to this. If you have if you have fire protection, like, but the problem is you have a force majeure that carves out riots and carves out civil unrest. I mean, if you have destruct, like if your property is destroyed as a result of that riot, I mean, they might say, okay, your commercial your property insurance policy does not really cover this. So you might look to a business interruption policy. If you have a business interruption add-on to any of your other policies, try to double check those to see if, to see if number one, I mean, you're covered by the pandemic stuff or number two, you're covered by, um, uh, I mean, the, this for whatever reason did not cover riots or anything like that. Um, it is my belief that most force majeure clauses would have, would have carved out riots. Um, Though, I mean, like I said before, you could pay additional money uh, to uh, to get that coverage. So, and this is a and this is a good stepping stone for another piece of just, I mean, general business uh, advice. I mean, if if your policies do not cover some of the things that have happened to you, talk to your insurance agency or, or agent and ask them: Is it possible for me to get coverage for the stuff that we're affected by? Um, I would say a lot of insurance agencies are not going to allow you to obtain coverage for things like a pandemic like COVID-19, which so widely affects everyone that they would have tons and tons of claims if they gave that, if they gave that out. I mean, that said, if you can afford to pay premiums for something that is, is not typical, but they're willing to do that, um, take a look at it and see if that, mean, if, if that works for your business and that's something that you need. Um, business interrupt, I mean, you should look at your insurance policies as negotiable and usually they do give you a menu of, uh, of policy add-ons that you can include um, that will give you a little bit better chance of making a claim in the event your business is truly interrupted. 
um, by these reasons. So other than that, I mean, previously, this is a slide from last month. Uh, I just want to touch on this again. So paycheck protection requirements. Previously, there was a good, I mean, they, they had come out with a good faith requirement. Uh, they basically said that any loans that were given out for PPP that were lower than $2 million were not going to be presumptively uh, investigated. Loans above $2 million will be investigated for any sort of fraud. Keep that in mind if you did get a ton of money through PPP, um, you, you will like need to account for it on, on the back end. The, most of the dates have come to pass uh, for, for people that did obtain PPP. You had 56 days to distribute funds after you received your initial PPP loan, loan amount from your bank. And I mean, you should have been pretty strict about making sure that you did distribute those funds. You don't really want, like, and if you didn't, I mean, you probably want to talk to an accountant or a lawyer to see what can be done about, uh, uh, about coming into compliance and making sure that you can take advantage of as much of, as much of the forgiveness of the PPP loan as possible. That said, if, it's, if your PPP loan is actually not going to be forgiven, I would say, don't really sweat it that much. 1% interest on a loan is a really low. It's almost, I mean, as a matter of fact, it's almost free money. Originally, the amount was going to be 0.5%, but the banks, the banks went back to the government and said, we are not going to issue these loans because we're not going to make enough money off of it. Um, it, it, would have cost the, it would have cost the banks more to actually compile the information to issue loans like that um, and work with the government than if, if they had not raised the interest rate. Um, that said, I mean, even for those people who may or may not have gotten PPP or, or did get EIDL, I mean, the interest rates on those is about 4%. That's really low, too. Um, I think most businesses, even if they're operating at minimal capacity, might be able to service the debt on those loans. So, I mean, whether, whether you did get forgiveness or not on the PPP, I mean, I would say don't really sweat it. It's, it's not that big of a deal. Um, and I would say just use that as more motivation to, bring, to get your business back up and running uh, post-COVID. So, um, okay, so we're going to move into venture capital deals uh, and just a general update on this stuff. Uh, I, uh, our law firm does a, a whole lot of venture capital deals. And I mean, I, I believe year over year, we, we are doing at least 100% more deals than we did this time last year, um, which, is, which is to say a lot. Um, just in the last five days, I've done six separate deals, uh, which were, which were all safe agreements actually. So, um, hey Kyle, I, before we jump yeah, in, uh, um, someone actually had a question about the, uh, PPP. Yeah. Um, do you mind dropping a few resources that might help companies understand the restriction brought on by the PPP? Um, essentially so, yeah. they're having companies asking, about what they must do or can't do as a result of accepted um, PPP funds. So, um, will you will you repeat that last part? I mean, they're having companies ask what? Um, asking them what they must do or can't do as a result of accepted PPP funds. So they're looking for online resources that can um, give like quick pointers and like answer those questions, like. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, I'll, I'll go through a little bit just off the top of my head, but I mean, I will follow up. I will obviously follow up this presentation with an email to everyone. And I can drop a few resources on there that I think the, the government has actually provided guidance. The SBA program has slides as well as, as well as some guidance documents that have been produced and appear to be very lawyerly and in some cases are presented in an FAQ manner. Um, so I'll find those and I'll send those out. Generally speaking, with PPP, 75% of it had to go toward payroll expenses. That means it had to go to your employees, right? And the idea was you had to hire your employees back. One of the major problems, one of the major problems we discussed too last time was the issue of employment, uh, of people that were receiving employment benefits rather than and, and we're refusing to come back to work. So the scenario was you ask your, you ask your employees, hey, we just received our PPP, we wanna hire you back. Like that employee goes, 
no way, man. I'm making like, uh, in terms of monthly salary on a prorated basis, I'm making 50 grand a year almost in like, I would be making almost 50 grand a year in salary just, just sitting on my butt right now. Um, obviously that was an issue. The government did not intend for that to be the case. Uh, but most states, I mean, in most states, you were actually making almost being unemployed than you were if you were employed. Uh, the, the other 25% is discretionary. So long as you, uh, so long as you use the money for one of the covered categories and purposes. So that means, I mean, if you put it toward rent, rent expense, if you put it toward your other overhead costs, like electricity bills, internet bills, uh, I mean, costs for equipment that you normally have, things like that. I mean, you definitely, uh, I mean, you definitely want to make sure that you're coming in under one of those covered categories to ensure that, hey, I am proving up all this. One of the best practices that I have, I have talked with people about and that other business owners have just said that they're, that they're doing is they're keep, they kept all the funds in a standalone account. Uh, and they, they did that to make the accounting really easy. They wanted, they wanted that account to go to zero and then to eventually close that account so that the accounting was really clean and tidy. Because the problem is if you were making even a little bit of money or have a little bit of money going out and you drop that into your operating account or into your savings account, you may very well have trouble tracking easier to what we call trace, um, trace the PPP loan funds when you just had that in a standalone bank account. I mean, that said, um, I mean, they're like, uh, I will send out those resources after I made a note of that. Um, and uh, I mean, if you have any other questions, do feel free to e email me at Kyle at JonesKurtz.com. Uh, many times uh, I can answer a pretty specific question um, and solve a problem for you pretty quickly. So we're going to go ahead and move on. The uh, for venture capital deals, like I said, we've been doing slightly more deals, uh, or we've been doing quite a few more deals uh, this time this year than we did this time last year. Uh, and I believe that many businesses have showed their strength throughout this, but we've also seen deals for pre-revenue companies come through the pipeline, which is, in my opinion, a bit odd because the, I mean, if you were looking at this from a finance standpoint and a market disruption standpoint, you should, there should not have been very many deals for pre-revenue companies. I think we actually did see almost more deals for pre-revenue companies than we did for post-revenue companies, though I would have to go back and do, and, and analyze the deal volume and the deal amounts for that. The, I mean, I, I would say if you are looking to know more about venture deals, Read this book. I mean, Venture Deals by Brad Feld is a very good, I mean, uh, overview of all the stuff you might want to know about this. Um, it is not a very lawyerly uh, a book. And in some cases, some of the stuff is, is a bit dated and is not the same as, it's probably not the same as what we do in practice, but it is, it is very good information. And if you're fundraising for the first time, it is, it is a must read. So buy it. It's not that expensive. Um, you can buy an online version of it through Apple or um, through Kindle, probably. So, I mean, the these are slides from last time, but I mean, I just want to I just want you guys to take a look at what types of transactions you can do. Um, I would say more typical transactions that we've seen. We're seeing a, a bit of an even mix with convertible notes and safe agreements recently. Um, I would say more safe agreements, especially for the pre-revenue companies, more convertible notes for the post-revenue companies. But still, those are very common early stage deals that we do. Um, uh, I think we, we're also seeing some people do some standard promissory notes, uh, which are like it, when you're talking about private financing, the standard promissory note is really just a high interest loan. Uh, we, and, and many times we will even put the, the standard loan percent amount, uh, like the interest rate at about 10 or 12%, which is pretty high. Um, it's not usurious and it doesn't violate law usually, but um, it, those are higher. And I anticipate that we're actually going to be seeing a, quite a few more of these standard promissory notes coming through the pipeline because we have a lot of people who have commercial real estate that they have payments to make on. Um, one of the downsides to 
reopening Texas so quickly uh, is that landlords have turned around and said, it is time for you to start paying on your, uh, on your lease agreements again. Um, to give you an idea, I actually have one client whose monthly cost, the monthly cost for their business is around 20,000, but 15 grand of that is actually just, uh, is actually just real estate. And I mean, we've been, we've actually been approaching some people about doing a standard promissory note, uh, just to, just to see if we can get them a loan. Um, and, and I mean, this can, and you can do this in different ways. I mean, this can be in the form of a line of credit where you explicitly have to issue written notice to the person um, that is offering you the note that you're drawing it down uh, in a certain amount. And you can set the increments in different levels. You can set them at, you have to draw down a minimum of 25 grand, 50,000, 100,000, depending on the size of the loan. Um, but I mean, the, and that's one of the negative effects though I do want to talk about is like, I think a lot of businesses are also selling equity stakes in their company in order to to cushion the losses a little bit. They're bringing they're bringing they're bringing money in using their equity uh, because the problem is before they were making money organically. Now not so much, um, especially with very real estate intensive businesses. We're seeing that a lot, um, and so I mean you, I, I would keep in mind like. You have flexibility with these different transactions that you can do. You can actually mix and match a lot of these. So we could do a mix of a standard promissory note with a convertible note. We could do an SPA with a promissory note. We could do, we can do this in many different ways. I would also say, I mean, but I do want to clarify, there are no absolutes. Every deal is different and it mainly depends on what you're offering the investors and what the investor is comfortable with. Number one, though, one of the things I do want to clarify for early stage companies, please do get out in front of the fundraising round and get organized early. Um, don't sit there and say, all right, we're going to do SPAs today, then we're going to do safes and convertible notes tomorrow, and we're going to keep mixing it up. You really want your, your investors to what, what we call subscribe to the investment through a subscription agreement. Um, in some cases, we actually do create PPMs the way we would for a venture capital fund, uh, which is a private placement memorandum. And the, I mean, you, you really want to get organized and tell people, here's the minimum investment for this offering. And I would say, go for more than what you need at the moment, because you never know if you're actually going to max the round out. Um, the, a lot of people, they have a goal they're shooting for based on what their needs are in the future. Um, I would say account for something like 20 to 50% additional funds than what you actually need at the moment, because I mean, you want to shoot for that high end and you're probably banking on the fact that I, I don't know, we're probably not going to hit that maximum amount, especially for a super early stage company. Um, that might be really ambitious. So, um, in, uh, I mean, other than that, though, I mean, there are some very typical terms you should be aware of, especially for safe, uh, safe agreements and convertible note agreements. We focus on what's called the discount rate. So your shares are going to convert at a discount. Usually, um, usually these safe agreements and convertible note agreements come with terms that allow the investor to get their money back. In some cases, that can be at an interest rate, but Typically, what we do is it's you get your money back with zero percent interest, meaning you basically gave the company a free loan. Um, that is not ideal. Usually, we see usually we see the safe agreement or we see the convertible note convert like at the next round of financing. Um, usually, there are terms that say, I mean, it, it has to be like it has to be an up round, not a down round, um, but. Obviously, the there, like I said, no absolutes. Again, I mean, uh, I mean, I would say very uncommon for people to get dividends unless the business is a cash-heavy business. Um, it's also, uh, I mean, it, in the event you like, the only other time you really see dividends is if the business were operating itself um, under some sort of securities regulation that required it to distribute money periodically. Um, the, the best example of that would be a real estate investment trust. 
the SEC requires that those people, that the people who run those companies um, and the corporations uh, that hold the assets of those companies distribute to shareholders a certain portion of the dividends or, or a certain portion of retained earnings uh, every few months or every month or so. Um, so, I mean, other terms that I would say are not as common, um, anti-dilution, like some people will ask for that. I generally say do not agree to it unless this person is, unless, this, unless you're getting certain preferential rights for that or unless you're getting tons of money for your business. Um, Anti-dilution can really mess up the, the economics of a cap table um, and it can make the calculations really difficult going forward. It also can hamstring you when you're raising future rounds because some because your investors will ask for your deal documents. This is another reason why you need to be organized. If your investors are getting asked for your deal, are going to ask for your deal documents, you need to make sure that I mean everything is very legal and tidy. You want to make sure you made I mean you you honored the corporate formalities of your bylaws, things like that. And I mean, you want to make sure that you checked all the boxes and complied with securities laws and filed um, all necessary securities filings, whether that be Regulation D, uh, Re Inform D, or uh, Blue Sky Law um, filings, which are state securities law filings. So um, another common one that, but a really common one that we do see, uh, I, I would say is a right of first refusal. A lot of early stage investors might want that. Um, it's, it, it, it all depends on what you negotiate though. So, um, uh, I mean, like I said, no absolutes again. Um, I promised I would go through this a little more in depth um, for some people. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, before we jump into that, we had another question. Uh, sure. Someone's asking why should they use convertible notes for post-revenue and safes for pre-revenue? Um, I mean, I would say... It depends on how it's worded, but um, that's generally just what we've seen industry-wise. Like for for us as lawyers, what people have been wanting to do, the safe agreements allow you. Uh, in some cases, will allow the um, investor to demand their money back. Um, it, it gives the investor the right to call back that money. The convertible notes, though, I mean, in some cases, I've found them to be worded especially the ones that I've seen that come from outside of our law firm to give the company the right to pay back the money from the next round's financing. So the idea is, I mean, you, these people would get their money back out of the future round of financing. It's not that it's coming organically. It could very well come organically, but usually it's the next round of financing as funneling the money back out and paying people for those safe agreements. I mean, the other reason is, I mean, these are, but though I would say these agreements are fundamentally the same when it comes to discount rates, usually we're seeing something like 10 to 20% as far as a discount rate for the amount of money. Um, also, I mean, these are, these can be pretty deal, these can be pretty investor favorable agreements, meaning like when the next round of financing hits, that discount is going to operate to give them more of the company for less money than they otherwise would have gotten. Um, in some cases, it could be favorable to the business. It, it really all depends on, on what the value of each share is in the next round of financing, um, how the economics shake out. But I mean, I, I typically see safe agreements um, for pre-revenue companies and convertible notes for post-revenue. Um, it's also, I, I would say the larger deals that we see, um, people are tending to do convertible notes. Um, and so w whenever we talk about hundreds of thousands rather than tens of thousands, I tend to see convertible notes nowadays. So um, I'm not sure that ex explicitly answers uh, the question, but it's just in our experience, that's what we're seeing at the moment. And just keep in mind, there's a bit of give and take regionally. So you'll see many safe agreements for You'll see many safe agreements for um, uh, for uh, places out in California. So, uh, it, like I would say, Silicon Valley they they find term sheets and deals that they like 
And then they sort of run with that for a certain period of time until somebody figures out something that they think works better. And so it's just, there's a little, there, there's a little bit of, I mean, market influence there, depending on where you live, what the investment, um, like what the investors want and things like that. Um, so, uh, any other questions for venture deals or no? All right, so moving on, um, employment law for startups. So uh, they, there are some topics I do want to talk about. I mean, but first and foremost, I want to talk about co-founder issues and disputes. Um, I, and I, I want to use an anecdote to describe a situation where um, we had, I, I originally advised somebody that was a potential client that did not retain the firm's services. They ended up calling me at like five in the morning on, uh, on last Friday and they wanted to and i spoke with that person for about an hour or so describing to them how to solve an issue so here's the facts these people um started their company through LegalZoom. they did not use a, a startup law firm or anything like that they did not use any documents that they got from their friends or, or other startups that they know uh they had three original founders, all of which have a pretty significant portion and even portion of the business. It wasn't quite a third, a third, a third, but I mean, at least, but there was nobody that had 51%. So they, uh, like on Thursday evening, they had a, a co-founder who had never paid any money to the company or anything like that, to basically say that they wanted to leave. Uh, I mean, typically in those situations, I would look to what are known as a restricted stock purchase agreement or restricted unit purchase agreement. And I would look to see if there were any recapture terms, notice requirements to those recapture terms for, for their equity. And the idea is we want to recapture the equity of the leaving of the, of the co-founder that is exiting or leaving because that person is sitting there saying, I do not want to perform my duties under this contract. I do not want to do anything related to it. Um, the and they and they're basically and you want to make sure that that person doesn't leave with a ton of equity. I mean, the problem with this situation though was there was never an RSPA or an RUPA in place, which means that we have to approach that situation differently. The solution is one of a few options. We go to the the exiting co-founder and we say we are going we're going to execute a new version of the company agreement or operating agreement or um, whatever shareholder agreement you might have for a corporation and we are going you are going to give your shares back i mean there are a couple other steps that need to be taken but generally that's 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 what we're going to do um the the problem with that though is you might have a person who who goes well no i technically own 29 percent of the company you gave it to me um, there's no agreement that says I have to do this. And so they'll leave with, I mean, this person could potentially have left with a third of the company. Um, I mean, the alternative to that solution is, if, especially for a pre-revenue company, uh, a company that really doesn't have very much in the way of assets, um, we can buy that person out for a nominal amount, whatever that means to you, $100, $1,000, whatever they think the value of it is. Um, that might be an easier conversation to have. If you, like, if you're wanting somebody to forfeit forfeit their rights to the to shares in the company for nothing, that is not as easy a sell, especially if the relationship has soured. I mean, the you might just have somebody who doesn't who doesn't want to work with you anymore. Offering them money is an easier proposition than than offering nothing. Um, it's also just easier to get uh, signatures. Um, the other thing is with co-founder issues and disputes, there is, uh, when we lawyers do things with people, uh, we do things with separate co-founders. In some cases, we might represent the co-founder in those situations rather than just the company. Usually we have to get a waiver of conflict of interest, um, to, it, to, uh, to do those sorts of things. In some cases, we cannot represent the entire, uh, company. Uh, or all of the shareholders or founders uh, in those situations. So just keep that in mind. If you are asked by a lawyer like, hey, I need you to sign this waiver of conflict of interest, the other guy needs to go get his own lawyer because I can't represent you both. 
Um, I mean, just be mindful that that's, that's, there are ethical reasons for that. And it has to do with nobody. We don't want to, we don't want to pull the wool over the eyes of an unsuspecting co-founder and, and alter their rights because we simply knew more than them. And one person could afford legal counsel versus the other. Um, that said, a lot of people, when they're starting early stage, when they're starting a brand new startup, um, they are not getting that waiver in place. They are not signing anything. Um, it, it's just, in many cases, we, uh, we do represent, I mean, the company in its initial formation and have everybody sign these agreements. I've heard of, I've heard of different techniques for executing that waiver and one in which I found controversial. Some lawyers are apparently putting waivers of conflict of interest into the operating agreements. Um, I would double check your, I would double check your organizational documents uh, to see if that's actually the case. Uh, it is my opinion that that is most likely not enforceable. Uh, and so, I mean, if, even if they did sign it, um, I believe it's, it's still not waivable. It, it may not actually be waivable um, unless they signed a full blown written agreement related to the waiver of conflict of interest and were fully informed of their rights given a waiting period of at least seven days, things like that. So, um, um, Hey Kyle, um, there's, I have a question. So would you recommend that when you have, let's say two co-founders, would you recommend that one co-founder should put more stake into the company so that they can own, I guess, at least 51% compared to the other 49? Yeah. I mean, if, if that's what it takes, yeah, so if that's what it takes to get you 51% or a majority of the shares, then absolutely, yeah. I mean, your because your argument then is, I, I contributed more money to this. Also, I mean, generally speaking, just remember, like, no one's going to love your startup like you, and at least one of the, the original founders of the business is going to be working harder than everybody else. And so you should reward the person who is working harder, putting more hours into this, putting more money at stake with more shares. And that should, that should be a fairly easy conversation to have. And, and for those people who are saying, like a lot of people, they want to start a company and they want to start out 50, 50. I don't recommend that. As a matter of fact, we just had an, we just had a shareholder situation with one of our clients where the bylaws were drafted by another law firm. I won't say which, but the law firm, if the bylaws were just not not that artfully drafted or they were intentionally drafted to ensure that at least three out of the four majority shareholders had to um, had to agree on an issue in order for there to be a majority. These people are split 50 50 in terms of arguments. That is a really difficult situation to be in. As a matter of fact, it makes it so difficult, in fact, that we that, that we are having trouble with the shareholder and convincing them to do anything in favor of the company. What's the solution to that situation? Well, if they hold an officer position or a board of director position, I might send them a, I might send them a letter and say, if they're interfering with the operation of the company to the point where it is affecting potentially even the survivability of the company, I might strip those people of their officer rights. I might strip them of, of all their duties um, and, and make it so that they cannot vote anymore. Um, there are certain statutes that allow for that in different states. Uh, the only problem with that is it is it, it can be a litigation time bomb. I mean, you're sitting there going, I'm stripping you of your rights. If that person has enough money to hire a lawyer and enforce their rights, they're going to they're going to apply for an injunction with a court um, or and, and, and basically file a lawsuit against you. And that can drive a wedge even further between co-founders. So. Uh, but I do, I do want to say, like, make sure that somebody has the authority to, uh, to break a tie in any situation. I mean, you want, you want the person who's going to be most committed to your startup to have the ultimate ability to, to, to make executive decisions. I mean, you, you don't want a situation where you're making every decision by committee there, because at that point, there's just too many chiefs, not enough Indians. You need, you need somebody to make a decision on something. Um, and that's especially important when we talk about venture deals. Um, some people, they'll say, I don't want to raise additional money because I don't want to dilute my interest any further. And that can happen when somebody's interest goes from 20 to 10% and then you're having to raise another, another round of financing. 
Like they, they're sitting there going, this isn't worth it for me anymore. Um, so, I mean, uh, are there any other questions related to that? Um, that was a good question actually. Um, yeah, um, one more. Um, if RSPA has already been created for the single founder initially, and once mm -hmm. to bring in a second co-founder, then do all RSPAs need to be redone or just create a new one for the co-founder? I would recommend just creating a new one for the additional person. If you're bringing them in as a co-founder of the company, um, that's, that's the solution there. I mean, you're, I mean, just so you're aware, like you've already begun to like do everything, do, a, do stuff related to the company. And so, I mean, I don't believe there's any reason for you to amend your RSPA unless, unless for some reason the, the joining co-founder is asking you to do something that says, no, the, like the, I mean, we have to have the same type of agreement. I don't want you to have more, like, I don't want you to have more favorable RSPA rights in that situation. I would usually just be like, okay, I mean, what about this is bothering you? And sort of put the ball in their court and see what they say. I mean, the and if and if it's the recapture terms, I mean, my recommendation is always to be inflexible on the recapture term with a joining co-founder. Like, I mean, you if that person says I want to take the recapture terms out, it, that is an absolute no. You need that. I mean, that 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 as a matter of fact is your security against against a bad co-founder. Um, and so don't. I mean, don't don't get don't get thrown around in those situations. I mean, but also do make sure that your co-founders are signing an RSPA. It's possible, though. I mean, it, that you could have somebody sign, like if they're coming on as a CIO or a COO, you could have them sign. I mean, one of a number of documents, such as employee incentive unit plans. I mean, related to the compensation they will earn. Um, which, I mean, those shares will usually come from what's known as an employee pool, um, which is just a, a set aside reserve of shares. Uh, and, and many companies, once they start growing and start having employees that they want to be, I mean, sort of invested in stakeholders of the company, they create employee um, pools and employee incentive stock plans. Uh, I mean, the other thing you would have them do instead of an RSPA, if you're doing an employee incentive stock plan with this person, have them sign an executive employment agreement. Um, and that's and that sort of is a good segue into our next um, topic. I mean, I do want to talk about the difference between employees and independent contractors for a bit. We discussed this last time. Um, the like, just so you're aware, if you run a corporation. Uh, early on, if you were calling yourself a CEO or you have a COO or a CIO, it, you cannot really classify those people as independent contractors to start with. I had, I had one person who claimed that they were the CEO of a Delaware corporation, but that they were also an independent contractor, which I said is, is not correct. Um, I did ask an accountant about it because I, I know for a fact that they probably did that for accounting purposes so that they wouldn't have to pay it. Um, so that they wouldn't have to pay certain taxes or, or into the state unemployment funds. Um, that said, like, don't do that. You're misclassifying yourself if you do. I would say just do everything by the book from the jump. And I mean, you're, you're gonna be better off for it. You don't, you don't want there to be any issues with you misclassifying yourself because that's, I mean, that, that's just not a problem you need or want to have. But um, it, the difference really is like, I mean, employees are always usually going to be trained by companies or they are going to be subject to direct control by other supervising employees, independent contractors. We don't worry about controlling them as much. The idea is we're not really interested in how they do their work. We're more interested in the results of their work, right? That's probably the short and sweet to that. Uh, it, it's also very common for you to be paid per job rather than um, on a on a weekly uh, on a weekly or biweekly basis, though some ICs do get paid on a biweekly basis, um, and that's and that's not uncommon. The um, also, I mean, usually ICs are deploying their own capital in order to make money from a company. Um, employer employees usually rely on uh, the company's resources, the company's equipment, the company's means of doing everything. 
So, uh, and then, I mean, some major things to understand that are sort of crossovers. So in the state of Texas, the, the state of Texas is an at-will employment state, which means you can fire uh, or terminate your employees or independent contractors for no reason whatsoever. And I, I would tell people that do have employers that do have employees, if it, it is often a, a, a general best practice to not give reasons to people for why they were fired. I mean, you can give them a reason and I mean, you can always document the reason why they were fired in internal documents, which you may be asked to produce by the Texas Workforce Commission if there's ever any is issue with that. Um, but I mean, generally speaking, like especially with COVID-19, a lot of people were just terminating their employees and not giving them any reason as to why it was happening. Though we understand what the reason is, right? Um, it, it was because businesses were shutting down uh, and they really couldn't afford to pay their employees anymore. I mean, the other thing to keep in mind is if you do have employees, um, I believe you do have to have an account with uh, the TWC as an employer so that you can pay into the unemployment programs uh, and, and, pay your, and pay your taxes on that or pay whatever your fees are for that. Uh, I mean, for independent contractors, there's no need to do that. Uh, that said, I mean, when there is, if you ever do receive a dispute from the Texas Workforce Commission about an employee, ver about a misclassification issue, um, if you ever receive an inquiry, like make sure you are checking the date on that. I mean, make sure that if the date has not passed, that, I mean, I recommend that you have like a, a lawyer probably help you look over that. Sometimes the TWC will be a bit uh, shady and they'll send you what looks like just a general survey about employment, but really they're trying to catch you like in in a situation where you're intentionally sort of misclassifying people. Um, the, the TWC has been known to do that before. And it, it appears to me that um, the TWC has also used COVID-19 as an excuse to investigate companies for misclassification. There's one instance in which that I know of that that was actually the case. And that was my fear all along, um, especially with so many people going and applying for unemployment, including independent contractors. That's just an excuse for independent contractors to sit there and say, no, I was actually an employee or bring that or bring the facts of their employment into dispute. Um, so, I mean, don't, and I would say if, if you do have a misclassification issue, I mean, an employment attorney should be able to help you with that. I mean, we have helped people walk through, um, filling out the different employment uh, like employment information that they receive for uh, unemployment benefits for their independent contractors uh, and, and employees um, that they were sending to the TWC on behalf of each uh, worker that they have. Uh, the other recommendation I would give to you is uh, make sure when you're referring to independent contractors uh, that you are referring to them as workers or contractors or something of or, or something of that nature. Do not call them employees. If you call them an employee, you have basically eroded the idea that you are calling them an independent contractor. There is a 20 factor test for whether a person is an independent contractor or an employee that is set forth by the IRS and that is adopted by the by the Texas Workforce Commission. Among those is how you refer to people. And if you refer to people, it, if you refer to independent contractors as employees, it is most likely that if that ever comes into dispute with the TWC, they're likely to find that they were actually employees. Um, so, and I would say it is, in some cases, it can be difficult to appeal TWC findings. So keep in mind that, I mean, you, you want to make sure that you're classifying these people from the outset um, properly early on. And it really does come down to what I talked about before, level of control. If you're controlling every, every aspect of these people's daily lives and job while they're on the job, that's probably more of an employee. If you're more expected in their results and you're just telling them, hey, I need you to go here, perform this work for an hour, and then, and then go to the next job. Like that person might be more of an independent contractor, could also be considered an employee, but I mean, I tend to lean the way of IC on those issues. So uh, do we have any questions for that before I move on? 
Um, I mean, here's some additional information related to what kind of contracts employees get employment agreements. Uh, you definitely want to paper these things up and have like a standard document that you use. Uh, I would say also you need to, if you have employees in different states, I would say you probably need a different document for each state um, that that person is mainly working in or working out of, uh, mainly because it's, it's more a matter of geographic location. I, I would say though that that issue is going to come up a lot more now that people are working remotely. We can have ICs who are agreeing to do work um, from, their, from their desks in California, but really the benefit is being seen in the state of Texas. So that actually creates a bit of an issue as to um, where, like, where are those people actually doing their job? Um, I mean, because everything's going virtual. So uh, that's going to be, I, I anticipate that that's actually going to be a pretty hot topic. And this is what I discussed before. Always have a non-founder, CEO, CFO, CIO, officer level person sign an executive employment agreement. Do not bring these people on in, in, without a contract. Do not bring anyone on without a contract. I mean, don't pay and don't and don't get into any sort of employee employer relationship without an agreement in place. These people need to know what their rights are, but they also need to know that you're going to take them to arbitration or take them to court if there's ever an issue. Um, they, need to know, they need to know that they're going to be liable if they don't win their, their, uh, their case. I mean, they need, to know that, uh, they need to know that they can be fired on demand. Um, it, which is, and so paper these things up on the front end. It's, it's one of those things that ounce of prevention equals a pound of cure. Um, and so... And, and actually, this is a major difference between what I talked about with RSPAs. If you're bringing on an officer level position or say a co-founder, um, some people may actually have an, an employment attorney for them negotiate, uh, negotiate preferential rights for their employment. So in, in some cases, I've seen, I've seen executive employment agreements actually say specifically that the the executive had to be fired for cause that you were not allowed to just fire that person at will which is actually i would say it can be a little bit more normal for these higher level executives um that said you do want these agreements to come with things like non-compete agreements you do want things you do want them to come with things like um you do want them to come with confidentiality agreements and actually i spoke last time in our in our previous presentation about non-competes and confidentiality. Non-competes are going to be longer and more restrictive the higher up you go in the hierarchy of a company. So the CEO of a Fortune 500 company is likely going to have an, an extremely restrictive non-compete agreement where that person, you could not have the CEO of a T-Mobile go work for the CEO of an AT&T. Likewise, I mean, you would want the the CEO, CFO, C CIO of the startup, not to be able to compete directly with your business and not be able to use the trade secrets that they learned and, and all of the confidential information that they, that they gathered and, and read through and, and actually put together themselves um, to start a competitive business. Um, and you can actually restrict those people a little bit longer. Normally we say a non-compete can last I mean, for a lower level employee, about one to two years, um, mid to level, mid level to high level employees, I mean, potentially even three to four. Um, if you go, if you go up to CEO level, the longest that's really enforceable under case law throughout the nation really is going to be five years. Uh, previously, there's been case law where people attempted to get a 10 year uh, non-compete. The courts generally don't allow that and don't enforce it. Uh, for public policy reasons. The reason being that's about a quarter, like if, if people work 40, 35 to 40 years, that is almost more than a quarter, if not an actual quarter of the entire, um, of the entire working life of an individual, if that person lives long enough. Uh, and so, I mean, they, they tend to say 10 years, no way. I mean, I haven't really seen much more than five. So, so. and usually those can be restricted by Geographic location, they can be restricted by 
uh, durational requirements, such as such as how much time, like five years, um, and also other things related to industry and and types of businesses that they might be working for and who they might be working with. So, um, uh, and I mean, there's it, and when courts approach that situation, they tend to look at what's known as the totality of the circumstances, meaning they 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 take a five or six factor test and they sit there and go. Okay, this is what we're looking at for this. I mean, they balance it and they sort of just rationalize things on a case by case basis, depending on previous case law. So, um, anyways, uh, what happens if I misclassify an independent contractor or an employee or an employee as an independent contractor? I mean, the thing to keep in mind: Workforce Commission, Texas Workforce Commission, always has the final say. That is almost always going to be the case in every state you're going to operate in. So make sure that you're abiding by the rules. Um, I mean, usually it's nothing is going to happen until somebody files for unemployment or files a, uh, an employment complaint against you, at which point the TWC or whatever workforce commission in your state will initiate an investigation. Um, and then you'll have to answer certain questions, fill out certain information, potentially even produce the employment agreements, which if you have papered something up, that can, that can cut in your favor uh for uh like for as as indicative of here's what we did we actually did define the relationship up front we made these people know know that they were 1099 independent contractors rather than employees so um anyways the i mean can i have my employees agree to mandatory typically yes in the state of texas mandatory arbitration provisions are uh pretty much enforceable so long as they're written properly uh, you might have heard some stuff about um, some stuff about California not uh, the not actually um, moving moving in the direction of not enforcing mandatory arbitration provisions because they're against public policy. The federal courts have also it, it appears to, it appears that they're leaning that way though um, that litigation is coming up often to the point where most companies are just abandoning the practice of mandatory arbitration altogether because their employees hate it so much. Um, but just so you're aware, arbitration is secretive. The judgments resulting out, out of it are secret, usually, and subject to confidentiality. And um, I mean, that confidentiality is binding to the point where if you did talk about it and, and you and you discuss confidential information or made it public, they're pretty much going to go after you for damages. And so, um, but I would say we I've been drafting some for so like mandatory arbitration provisions and more of our agreements, mainly because I mean, certain industries, certain jobs, you want to keep the disputes a secret, especially if you have a ton of employees, you probably don't want, um, you probably don't want one employee, like one issue that affects a ton of employees being litigated in open court and having that judgment being subject to public scrutiny, like the, that, that is a nightmare situation where you might have an onslaught of litigation uh, related to something that you did that was wrong. So, um, I mean, other than that, I mean, do we have any questions right now or no um, related to all this stuff? So, no. Before I move on. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, generally speaking, so this is stuff from last time. Uh, I mean, I'm going to blow through some of this and talk about some other, uh, some other topics. If you want to learn more about what, what we're talking about here, uh, I talked about it more at length in our last presentation. So, uh, I mean, LLCs, like last time we compared LLCs to corporations. Um, I am seeing like some, I mean, there, there are some companies out there, online companies that are recommending that you be a Delaware corporation right out of the gate. Um, I cannot recommend something like that as an, as a total absolute. Yes, you should be like a Delaware corporation right out of the gate. It really depends on your business. I have to take a look at what do you want to start? What makes sense? I would say if you're planning on taking an outside investment through a venture capital deal, um, such as what we discussed previously, by all means, uh, use a, um, I mean, by all means, you should have a Delaware corporation set up so that there are no issues. Um, but one thing I don't think I talked about last time though, is if you are converting into a LLC, or if you're converting into a corporation from an LLC, there may be certain tax implications related to that conversion. 
Um, so you want to make sure that you're doing like a, a tax-free reorganization of the company or conversion. You want to make sure that's not creating any sort of issue related to securities that might be outstanding. And if there is, you need to fix those problems um, before, before you finalize the conversion. Um, I mean, you need to make sure that you're also, like if you do have previous investors with your LLC, you need to notify them that you're converting into a different company because it does affect their rights um, as to what they can do as shareholders. Uh, there are different, especially if you're converting from say a Texas LLC into a Delaware corporation. I mean, those are different state laws. They might be, they might be somewhat similar, but you do need to cover, cover yourself on those ends. And so I recommend make sure you have a lawyer do that. I don't, I don't necessarily you suggest that you use self-help in those situations. That, that law is just too complex and is too fact-based based on what the business has going on, what it has in assets, intellectual property, X, Y, Z. So um, corporations though, I mean, are subject to double taxation. The, the, the reality though is, I mean, they do give a lot of protection to investors and shareholders. They do give uh, a lot more protection in my opinion to, or, or I mean, somewhat more protection to the people that run them than other, uh, other business entity forms. Um, so, I mean, in the, I do want to touch on LLC organizational documents generally. The certificate of formation is just the original formation. You usually want a company agreement or in other states uh, besides Texas, you're going to get an operating agreement. This is a step that is skipped or not done properly the first time around by many, by many owners or by many, uh, by many people who form an LLC. As a matter of fact, like, I mean, oftentimes what we see that is an issue is you have a short form agreement for three to four original founders, when in reality, I would say you should probably have a long form agreement, mainly because you want what are known as tag along rights, drag along rights, and right of first refusal for certain things. You wanna be able to drag people through a sale of the company if you're a majority owner, of an LLC and usually a longer version of a company agreement or operating agreement is going to include those terms. Um, that said, I mean, the, I mean, you can, uh, I mean, like the, that said, you can decide things by committee with your, with the other LLC members or managers, but I mean, you absolutely want to make sure that you are papering, like you, you're papering the original formation up properly and making sure that the founders like especially if they're majority owners have certain rights to be able to control the company at, um, at will more so than other people um, that have that, that have minority stakes. So I mean the other important thing um, is IP assignment agreements. If most people when they come to us and they talk about uh, and they talk about um, their intellectual property, they've usually already purchased their website which is normal usually you make your first purchases with your uh with your personal credit card things like that that is i mean that's startups i mean that's that's what happens but you absolutely need to transfer the ownership or the title of your intellectual property into the company by way of one of these ip assignment agreements if you've already purchased the uh if you've already purchased the website or have already begun developing software and you haven't signed one of these IP assignment agreements, I recommend you do so as soon as possible because most of the value in a company when you're selling it for acquisition, like to when you're selling it or it's being acquired by a third party, if they're gonna to wanna to see that this company owns its intellectual property, that includes trademarks and patents, that includes copyrights, that includes the software you're developing, that includes, I mean, it, things like employee handbooks, staff handbooks, um, contracts that you have that you use on a regular basis to make money. Um, and last but not least, you want to make sure you're getting a unanimous written consent. This is a formality that gets skipped a lot by lawyers. Some people, they say, I don't really need that on the initial formation. I say, do it anyway. It's just one of those things that, I mean, it's good to have in mind that whenever we're doing something major or material to the company, we're acknowledging that we executed IP assignment agreements. We're acknowledging that we executed company agreement or an operating agreement or an RSPA or, or an RUPA. So, um, and the corporate organizational documents tend to be very similar. I would say the bylaws may be a little bit shorter 
than a long form LLC company agreement. Um, though, I mean, these are generally the same. The other thing I want to talk about though, is with, with respect to restricted stock purchase agreements, um, there is what's known as an 83 B election filing that I believe most people should make early on uh, with, with an early stage startup. I mean, whether this thing is post revenue or you're coming in under an RSPA as, as, a, CEO, as, a, as a CEO or a CIO or whatever uh, top level executive you might be, like um, you want to make sure you're filing that election because it, it, it ultimately saves you a bit of money in taxes, especially if the value of the company goes up. If you sell your stuff later on, you'll find that the math will work like, I mean, the, under the 83B election, you will save yourself, I mean, quite, quite a bit of money. I mean, it might not be a ton, but it's going to be somewhere in the thousands usually um, if you successfully made that election within the first 30 days of signing something like an RSPA. And that, and that election really needs to be made when you have stock that is going to best over time. So, I mean, uh, there, are other, there, are other, um, there are other elections you can make. I'll talk about those at, during our third um, presentation next month. But um, I just want to keep that in mind for those of you who might be considering doing these. Um, if you didn't fill out the 83B election or didn't do it, um, that might, you might have, I mean, you might have to pay a little bit more in tax, but I wouldn't worry about it too much. Uh, the only, the last thing I would say about the 83B election for it's you do not um, have the right to go back and correct that. Like if you didn't file it within the first 30 days, you've lost it. And the IRS will sit there and tell you that they have no authority to um, to make it so that you can get your like get that election filed. And we get questions sometimes about can I just amend and restate the restricted stock purchase agreement? Typically, no. Um, you're basic in that case. What you're basically doing, you you try to restart the clock. I I had that question posed to me about a month and a half ago. I suggested no. Um, on that issue. And I believe that was the correct interpretation. The reality is if you're, I mean, there is a, I believe there is one attorney who has said there is a way to do it, but in my opinion, you're, what you're risking is a, is an inquiry or an audit by um, the IRS. And quite frankly, if you get audited by the IRS for that purpose alone, you're going to spend more in legal fees or accounting fees um, just to fight that, just to fight that issue um, than you would if you otherwise had, um, had just done everything properly and just let it go. So um, I believe we're running out of time. Uh, uh, are there any questions left, um, Tritt, uh, related to anything I just covered or no? Um, yes, so a question just came in. Do you know if a company has to report to the IRS value of restricted stock as it vests? Um, I do not believe they actually do. That is actually a very good question. Um, I believe it's really like the value of it will be reported when you make that initial election because what they're worried because what they're worried about is um, the basis of that stock originally. So, and, but that's on you as the person who is under that RSPA. Um, when when you do make money and you you see what is known as um, realized gain, meaning you've sold your shares either partially or completely. Like you, you will report the value of what those shares sold at to the IRS affirmatively to make sure that you're um, coming in. Like, I mean, to make sure that you're complying with the law and making sure that you're calculating what your taxable gain was, right? So, um, I don't believe that companies have an affirmative duty to do that, though, mainly because um, it's just one of those things. I mean, that said, if you are issuing additional stock. Uh, if you are issuing additional stock in your company, the way, I mean, you do have to recognize the issuance of that stock formally and, and make sure that you are, I mean, doing it, so, doing it by that unanimous written consent and by maybe even a resolution of the boards, uh, resolution of the board of directors or managers, depending on what kind of entity you are. You do also want to make sure you're um, basically altering any bylaws, uh, with respect to that stock. 
Um, this is especially important. Like you want to make sure that, um, I mean, it, for companies that are about to take on employees, you make sure you want to make sure you paper up anything related to an employee pool and the creation of that employee pool. So, um, but I don't believe there's an affirmative reporting duty on that fact, though. I can look that up um, to double check it. Um, that's a very good question, though. Are there any other questions? Um, yes, another one just popped in. Yeah, go ahead. C Corp companies already formed and initial documents created. Now, if we create a new website due, due to COVID-19 pivot, do we need to reassign IP? Um, probably, I mean, I would say like, if you've already, if you've already signed the IP, I would have to look at your IP assignment agreement to see if it covers additional IP that's purchased by the company. That said, if you purchase it with the company's assets and you purchase it, it like you purchase it with the company's credit card or you purchase it with um, the company's cash, generally speaking, like the tracing of that of those funds dictates the intellectual property ownership. So it, and so long as you already have an IP assignment agreement in place, you should be covered. Though that question, like I would have to read your agreement to be to be quite to be certain. Um, that said, if you did want to, if you did want to, like, I mean, just double check, uh, double check everything, or just double up on everything, you can amend and restate the IP assignment agreement and include that new website with it. I mean, I would, I would say though, like, um, I mean, it's it, many companies as a general practice do not do that um, as they as they go on because that would be very paperwork intensive and expensive from a lawyer standpoint to do um though i mean it, but but yeah the general point is if you have an ip assignment agreement already in place and it's broad enough to cover anything that's purchased by the company like thereafter then you should be good right so um any other questions related to that nope i think that's it <clears throat> okay um well i mean i'm going to uh I mean, I'm not going to keep going on and on. Uh, so for anyone that might have an additional question, for anyone that might have a, uh, uh, I mean, just a, I mean, just something specific to their business, do feel free to email me at Kyle at Jones Um, I try to be pretty receptive, um, to outside emails and, and helpful to people. Uh, and I mean, if you want to give me a phone call, my phone number is two one zero. Eight five four nine two four six. I'm usually pretty responsive on the phone as well. Um, uh, for those people that attended, I want to thank you for coming, and I want to thank you for the questions you asked. It's always very helpful when we do get questions because a lot of people have these same exact questions. So uh, don't ever feel like you're asking a question that sounds dumb or anything like that. Seriously, all the questions we got today are very good ones. Like and. A lot of people are wondering the same things, and uh, and so I mean the this I mean the collective question question asking is is very helpful for the group. So other than that, though, I mean just to let you know, uh, probably sometime in the next few days, I will upload the video uh, of this presentation as well as uh, try to send out the slides and everything like that, and uh, send you guys a thank you note. So. Um, thanks, Trit. Thanks to Capital Factory for helping us out with this. Really appreciate it. Um, and then we'll see you guys next month, first Tuesday of the month. Take care, guys.